This is a Women with Disabilities Victoria podcast. We acknowledge that these podcasts were recorded on the traditional lands of the First Nations people of this country. We acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded and this is and always will be Aboriginal land. From the Outskirts is a series of podcasts featuring women with disabilities who live and work in regional Victoria. I'm Liz Wright, a disability activist and advocate. I'm also the Manager of Community Inclusion and Women's Empowerment at Women with Disabilities Victoria. All the interviews were recorded in each person's home or workplace, so from time to time there is unexpected background noise. Andrea Woodbury is a musician and disability activist. She's passionate about ensuring the voices of women with disability are both heard and respected. My name's Andrea. I'm on Wurundjeri land in the Kulm Nation. Hi, Andrea. How are you? Well, thank you, Liz. Andrea, how long have you lived out here? Probably close to 10 years. What prompted the move to come and live in Ringwood and where um, did you come from? I've always pretty much lived in the air most of my life. I actually moved out to go to university when I was 17. Then I got sick again and got sick and I was oh, sick when I was almost 30. What did you get sick with? Encephalitis. For those who be listening who don't know what encephalitis is, are you able to explain? Yes. That? It's when the skin that sort of, um, the membrane that surrounds the brain gets inflamed. The people that get it have different experiences because it's a brain thing. I am like, I don't get seizures. I have a friend who who has encephalitis. I had encephalitis and she gets multiple seizures every single day, up to 300 seizures. I, I'm seizure free, thank goodness, but then again, I'm unable to read properly because it affected, um, it put pressure on, my, on the area of my brain that helps my brain interpret letters and words. So I, I can read, but the way that my brain processes things, you might say, with alligator, I might say, oh, uh, at the end, and then the A double at the beginning, I might remember it's alligator because I could read before I got sick. But, um, it's, yeah, it's such and go. Uh, if if I recognise a word, I can read it easier than if I um, words that I don't recognise. Like Bunny words are hard to interpret sometimes. But so, are you a person that um, uses audio as your main means of taking in communications? Pretty much, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, are you an audible book reader? Oh, not anymore. I don't have time. You don't have time. What do you do? What do you do with your time, Andrew? I coordinate a band. Oh, what's the band called? Ad Hoc Rock. Tell us a bit about that. Okay, Ad Hoc Rock is a band for people that love music and live with disability. We have a couple of autistics. We have ABI me. We have a soft diagnosis as Burgess. And he also has an ABI too. Um, we recently got on board an off-site drummer because he will have all the nice songs. And when we, um, when we need him, he'll come play for us. Can you say that again? Who's the drummer? He's, he's also another autistic. Okay, yeah. Um, he works when we practice. He learn the songs off site. And when we're ready for him, when we need him, we'll just fit in with us and come and help us out. How long's the band been together? I've been with the band for well over 10 years now. Yeah. It's been called Winston's Black Dog. Right after Winston Churchill's. Oh, so Winston's Black Dog. Yeah, because oh, it, it, was, it, was, it was initially a mental health band. It used to run out of each at um, Greenwood Avenue, so it was initially a mental health band. Yeah. And then people other disabilities on the band, such as myself, we changed it to Agile Rock. Are you part of the disability band scene? Do you know other bands like the Bipolar Bears? And- I've, I've seen the Bipolar Bears perform. They're so loud. That out loud. Yeah, because um, I used to be part of a thing called Stage Club that's how I got involved with that. Because this with a um, thing called Stage Club that happened a couple of times a month at Greenwood Avenue each. A jumping off sort of thing for either bands that um, were trying to get recognised or acts were trying to get recognised. We, we had poets, we had dance troops. Um, we even had a band from Perth one time come along over in the area that they thought they'd come perform with us. Wow. Um, at Stage Club. So I used to be on the door at Stage Club. And then one time the, the person, the staff member organised Stage Club, he said, Andrea? I said, yes. Well, we'd like to come and practice with the band and be part of the band. So that's how it so became part of what was then Winston's Black Dog that is now at Hawk Walk. Oh, wow. And you're, uh, you coordinate the band now? I coordinate the band now because basically the person that used to run with me 
he moved his other band's practice to Friday so he can't come to this practice anyway. And when COVID happened, we had to practice here because um, but other than the fact that um, Lake had got Lake had got shut down, we actually um actually had a big flood just before COVID. So we we're practicing here anyway due to the fact that um the place we put on the, the the place our practice space was fl- um flooded uh, and use it and mold and um, yeah. couldn't use it. So we we're practicing here anyway. And then COVID hit. We've been practicing ever since. Which suits me because I now call and the band that we jump on YouTube. Where we, we play whatever we've got to play, we feel like. Just a way of unwinding for people getting the, getting the sort of music choices out. Because most members are younger than me, they've got like, very young tastes. Yeah. And we've also got another another person older than me. And he has older tastes. It's interesting. Well, it's good to have an eclectic kind of. Um, song sheet to choose from, yes. really. Yeah, well, um, I, I well, songs is very eclectic. We've got stuff from back in the sixties with Rolling Stones. We've got stuff with new stuff as, um, like Green Day, yeah. Bit of an Excess. We also have. So it's mainly covers. Yeah, I we've only written one song. Or I, I wrote one song. I have written a second one, but um, I've got to sort of workshop the lyrics because right now it's too long. Because I also do um, a project project with W W H E. Is that Women's Health East? Yes, Margins to Mainstream. Oh, yes. Tell us what's, the, what's Margins to Mainstream. Margins to Mainstream is a program to prevent violence against women with disabilities. Yes. Now, I've been involved with it for the past, or oh, I think two and a half years, two, two, two years plus, because we've, two, two, we've done two of the 16 Days campaigns. From COVID, we, we, did, we did lots of presentations online for COVID, and last year we did some live presentations, which was lots of fun. Um, getting out to the libraries and um, presenting our video. And we did a presentation at Yarra Rangers as well. So the council out here is Yarra Rangers and Knox. No, no, no. And this is Maroondah where we this are. This is Maroondah, okay. Maroondah. Yep. Well, that's good. You, so your reach is pretty good. Yeah, well, Worms Health East um, covers a lot. And plus I've been involved with um, when, I, when I did my – well, I have a community development diploma – and when I did my first placement, I went out to what is called the Outer Eastern Community Inclusion Alliance. Yeah, um, I know, OSHA. OSHA, yep. Yeah. You know, so I've been to those meetings even before Amanda May was there. Um, and what are those meetings about? Anything, anybody has disability stuff to present, it, um, they can just present. I, I've, I've advertised that across several times across the years. I really need members. So is it kind of like an information sharing network yeah, for yeah. people with disability? So It's not just for people, it's for organisations. For example, the um, last meeting where um, Women's Health East and myself presented an update about our um, agents and managing, but there's also an NDIS coach and they have they usually have updates about their grants um, operations, and they've also just started a um, clothes. It's like it's for, for women returning to work. They have like the, they they collect all these sort of decent office type clothes. They sell them at low cost for women trying to get back to work. Oh, that's a great idea because it's it's expensive to get back into professional gear if you're living on a DSP trying to look for work. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you're pretty involved in the disability scene and involved in a lot of advocacy. Yep. And so you'd consider yourself a self-advocate as well as an advocate for others? I guess you could say that. You know, before you said you're really busy and so you're involved with margins to mainstream, managing the band. You're also a health expert at WDV, is that yep, correct? Yep, yep. And how long have you been doing that? Since the very beginning of the health expert project, I think it was April, May, year before last, I think. I don't know. I always check the time. Yeah. Co- what do the health experts do? I usually do the WDV as in to women with disabilities presentations, which um, we sort of we present, we'll sort of discuss things like advocacy and resources and our experiences as women with disability. About, Within the health system. Yeah. 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 For example, I actually it's on the video as well, but um, I usually present a story, but I went to see an eye specialist. The eye specialist couldn't see it, couldn't figure out why I could not read. When he finally understood I had an ABI, he spoke to me like this. Like an idiot. Yes. It's pretty common. Yep. It was the, the set that he made it to the this this video. I've also been. i also was involved with that. I um, mind the gap project was one of thing at the Trail Bundle last year. What's mind the gap? Basically, it's about people with mobility challenges 
Um, they had some various other things to try and help boarding trains easier. Okay. And I actually had a good think about it after I went home. I said, because in Melbourne we have such different gaps and different heights and different things as in boarding trains, it makes it very hard to make anything sort of consistent. So um, I aimed a lot of points about that. So It is pretty true that, that um, there are inconsistencies in, in wherever you go and when, when you've got like a mobility issue or an, an eyesight issue or a perception issue, it's really difficult to get on and off a train safely, yeah. Yeah, I went to Boswell Station and they had the, the new platforms they're supposed to just wheel across. I said, no, you need to put the ramp out. I cannot board the train without assistance. And I had a full an argument. I made the train late, which was all my problem. But um, I said, I'm not getting on that train unless you put the ramp out. Yeah. Or unless you physically help me on the train because I can't do it. I just can't do it. Because I, I soon said before, the walls are going to drop in my walker. The walls are too, not big enough to sort of cover the gap. So yeah. you, you help me or I can send you all day back in the train wait. And in my head I was thinking, I can, I can send you all day. Yeah. And you've got the train's got to go, so I got I got my ramp in the end. It's interesting the assumptions people make about a person with disabilities abilities to do things like just get on because you've got a walker, whereas it's not safe for you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, because if, as soon as you cross a gap, the wheels drop down. Yeah, yeah. If I hit a stone, I can fall backwards. I was actually um I went to La as an adventure, I went to La by train and um, taxi and last it was a taxi I said I need to go to this place I gave the, the taxi driver the address he was a local taxi driver he drove me and he said oh, I can't find it because he accidentally parked in front of the, the, the placard saying where it was you know the, the a, a fan saying where he was he got to go out there and he got to go up so I, I went out and I walked up and and I thought I'm lost I ran the place and then actually the neighbour who actually found me on his property well, when they parked back and he um he found me both and I did it and I hit a stone for him back and slipped, slipped my head open. So I was bleeding everywhere. And the poor guy. Yeah. <laughs> um I said, Well, I got told by my taxi driver, he said, Well, you taxi driver told you wrong, you should have been back where you were initially. So he took me back and yeah. Do you think transport is an issue for most people with disabilities? Yes. Uh, it is easy if you have a scooter. But even like, for example, tall doors ban my existence because I don't have the balance to open or close them because my, my disabled tall doors are so damn heavy. I have to ask them with you guys to um, go to the top most of the time. I just want to get back to you and your personal life. You've got a, a dog. Yes, a gorgeous dog. Yeah, tell us about Trouble. Trouble's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I'm biased. I can't have children, so Trouble's my, my baby. She's eight years old. Yeah. She's a husky cross shepherd. She sheds a lot, but she's still adorable. It doesn't matter. You can't see the, all the hair anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> when she was a puppy, we sort of we sat with her through the, for her first thunderstorms and her first fireworks and her first car trips. Now she sits with the thunderstorms. I wake up. She sits with fireworks. I wake up. She's in awesome. Um, we, we came home once and she had like a blue halo around her head and we just couldn't stop laughing. It turns out she, she'd been in the garbage bin, which is just behind over the corner there, yeah. and she got the bin there stuck on her head. <laughs> <laughs> and we were in hysterics. And we came in like, try and pull you made a mess! <laughs> this, like, this over the floor. So, yes, <laughs> we need to have a photo of that. And it's quite... You've got a photo of that? Yes. And my best friend says, she's looking up at you saying, it wasn't me, me, mommy, it was you, mommy, it wasn't me. (laughs) 
Mm. Um, she hasn't come out of the bedroom yet. Oh, no, I wanted her to come out. She's very shy. Do you take her walking every day? I can't take her walking, yeah. but um, my support workers are about And when they, when the weather's good, that she gets lots of walks. The other day, I had to go out, so my support worker took her down to the dog park, and she loves it. In this local area, is there a lot of amenity? Can you walk around here quite safely? Would you say, or Physi- do you drive? Physically, can, but psychologically, no. Because my balance problem, anyway, it's my. Um, my brain, because when I was um, after this, I got out of seat. My mother used to say to everybody who would listen, including me when I was, um, I could hear her, Andrea has bad balance. And that thought has festered in my head, and no matter what I do, I just can't get rid of that thought. You can't shake it. Yeah. So most of my balance problems are in my head more. Yeah. Yeah. Like I just look at me. I, I have strong legs. If I if I have something behind me, I can balance for a while. If I have nothing behind me when I'm standing, I get really panicky. Yeah. In fact, I had a fall almost two weeks ago now at Baronia Leisure Works. There's a bump in the in the carpet because you can't see because it it's carpet covering it as you enter. But as I was leaving the other day, because I need to sort of turn around and, and navigate, I need to turning one side to be going straight up the slope. I was walking around some people chatting and because I was walking around those people, I hit that bump and I just went over. I spent the night in Moondo Hospital. Lots of fun. And lots of, a couple of horrible nurses that were totally better. I know, I know this physical is a cover, but it doesn't excuse saying to me because um, I, I said when I had sea cot and I need to have a catheter. As soon as I said sea cot, I said I need to have a catheter. Yeah. And eventually when I got one, I said, I need a scoop for an EAM, a scoop for an antibiotic. Um, they said to me, you asked the catheter? I thought, um. how dare you? And then I had the doctor, and as I was leaving, she said, why do you have catheters? I said, one, it's only business, but free information because I was in the hospital for 40 months when I was um, 20. Yeah. For me, they asked such stupid questions because they're curious. Yeah, but it's not respectful. No. You know, you can. there's asking and asking. As a counsellor, you get taught not to ask questions because you're curious. Yeah. I think doctors need to learn the same thing. Yeah, well, yeah, look, I mean, I think it's great you're a health expert because you had quite a lot of experience in hospital and understand... How to speak how, up, how, I've had to speak up for myself, yes. Yeah, but also how difficult it can be. Yeah. I mean, I think for a lot of people with disability, the questioning around how you, you live and what you need is irrelevant. People don't need to know. You know your body. You're the expert of your own disability. And the best thing to do, if you're unsure, ask me. Yeah. I know myself better than anybody else. Yeah, true. You don't guess at me because I know better than you do something. I'm also involved with an Indigenous group called Yengali. I've been involved with them for over a year now. What sort of songs do you sing? We sing some in, in language. One of the things that Uncle Vin often tells us um, is that when you go to visit a neighbouring um, nation or a neighbouring area, you need to know the language just as a courtesy. And you often need, often as an Indigenous person, you need to know at least three or four languages. And his favourite thing is, White people call us dumb. But we had to learn four languages. Yeah. And white people call us dumb. And we sing in um, the Tasmanian dialect because basically the Tasmania got mashed into one dialect. We sing in um, a language. One of the one songs is from Perth and a couple of songs have been t- translated into the native language of our elders. So we sing um, a song that Auntie Irene has translated a verse of the song into her native language. And it's down in the kitchen, which has a fun song to sing. It has actions for the kids. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, down in the kitchen. And we also sing um, a, a lullaby song called In and A. I'm not, I'm not sure what language is that, that one. A, is that Tiddus? Used to sing In and A? I think Tiddus is sing. It is, it's, a, it's a lullaby that they sing for, they sing for generations. Yeah. In and A, Kapuana, In and Yes, it's beautiful. 
and we see amazing a both amazing grace in language and Boer Farah is about is a language as well. Um, How did you get involved with this indigenous music group? <laughs> it's quite a funny story. My mother in law got asked to be the vocal coach. So I worked to the powers of B, which is M M I D P. Yeah. Mullum Mullum Indigenous Gathering Place. Yeah. I worked there said, Is it okay if I come on? My mother in law is gonna be vocal coach. So it's okay come on to have a sing with everybody. And after the first the first visit, I went to visit, I said, is it okay if we come back again? And they said, yes, we love, the elders love to come back again whenever you want to. So I've been coming back ever since. Yeah, it's been such an enjoyable thing. Learning language, learning the meanings. But because of my sight speech impediment, I have trouble pronouncing some of the Indigenous language, but it's just great fun. So you're pretty busy. <laughs> like, so, um... so, so Mondays is... um. In Gali, then we have Tuesdays every single week counselling. Wednesday I have support work and work if I have WWE. Thursday is um, WKHE. Friday is swimming and band. Weekend for resting. Uh, weekend I have support work Saturday. And usually the family gets together on the weekends, or poor family, because my, my mother passed away. My dad lives overseas. Where does your father live? Malta. My, my family's all Maltese. My parents are Maltese. My aunts and uncles are Maltese, actually. Only one uncle was Australian because um, my, my aunt got married over here. She went to Australia. So did your dad move back as he got older? Well, see, my parents got divorced and my dad married someone he'd known from Malta and my mum married an Australian fella. Wow, so your dad moved back to Malta with his Maltese wife? Uh, well, he comes here when he can, but he, his wife would come here due to COVID. Also, his wife um, is uh, the best health, so sometimes like, he had to cut his chip short last year because... Mum got sick, I called mum because she's my stepmum. So she, he went, had to go back early because mum was sick. She'd only just been cleared to fly again and she got sick again, so she was pretty yeah. disappointed. You mentioned mother-in-law. So you've been married and are married? I, I am married, yeah. yes. Mother-in-law, yeah, she actually runs a choir course in Galata. That's how Paul and I met because I, I did a work placement f- for community involvement for my swimborn swimborn course at Lake Goodwe. Paul lives. So one of the things we did was we sent around a questionnaire to sort of as a community of all things to engage residents. Yeah. We had a music therapy student working with Lakewood to sort of engage the community. And once one day I went to um went to office, I called everybody in the building and in the, the intercom system who mentioned that the like choirs and music, whatever, and got them to come down to choir practice. And Paul came along. And a while later, um, because I forgot my music books at home, I said, Paul can take me home. I, I left my car books at home, see? He came, picked me up and put me home, got my books and went back in. Then a while later, I was practicing with um, Ad Hoc Work for a gig. He turns up my door and I said, for a, date, for a date. Where'd you go for your first date? The first unofficial date was to um, to Knox. Um, we went to... Um, I'm not a pub sort of thing in, um, in the Knox Ozone. But for our first official date, we went to Ringwood Lake with his dog. So um, you live separately? Yeah. And that works well? Yeah, financially and um, horse mental horse is not mixed with my physical physical challenges. So. Yeah, I get that. We, you know, we were talking off mic earlier that having things set up in the best and most convenient way to suit your disability is a great advantage. It is. Yeah. Paul finds my, my disability sometimes very stressful. I find his very stressful, so. It's a mature decision to come to, too. People sort of, you know, well, you have a disability, won't it? You should need to to move with you. I said, well, I, can, I, play, I play can move well on my own. Thank you very much. Yeah. I do not need my husband here 24-7. I, I, don't, I don't need anybody here 24-7 because I'm pretty, when I've, I've injured myself because I've had a fall, I'm pretty high functioning. Oh, no. Well, you can see that this your house is set up for you and, it's, and it works really well and that's great. Andrew, it's been absolutely lovely talking with you today and I feel like I've learned a lot about you and all of the things that you do and it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you and Trouble. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Liz. To find out more about Women with Disabilities Victoria, go to wdv.org.au. Mm-hmm.